Welcome back to the channel. So this week we're tackling the SDKFZ 2519, uh, which is the uh, Cannonwagen. Uh, this is on the Orfs D uh, chassis, if you like, uh, which has got a slightly different uh, makeup on the, on the the way the arm is done. It's a bit more simplified to the original that's sometimes known as the Hannah Mag. Um, that also had a Canon version as well. So this is a 7.5 centimeter. Uh, low velocity cannon that was put in these for I'm not actually sure what it was for um, probably infantry support I don't imagine it's for taking on tanks or anything like that it, it's a very low velocity so I imagine it's um, high explosive rounds for infantry support so it would go in obviously and clear the way for the infantry to come on in behind uh, we are talking classic Tamiya here I mean I grew up on this kit I, I made this bought it from Toy Master when I was about uh, 11 or 12, loved every minute of it. The, the whole thing, the, the figure, the idea, the box art, everything's just perfect with it. I, I absolutely love it. Uh, there are better kits. So if you wanted to do an accurate version of this, uh, you really want to go for the AFV Club boxings. They're really, really good. Really good. Um, this is simple. It's 1990s tooling. It's rather basic. Uh, not a huge amount of detail. Quite a number of accuracy errors uh but at the end of the day it looks like a 251 half track so um what you've been seeing there so far is me getting the uh the the, the steering and suspension system for the front two wheels on and also filling some ejector pin marks on the rear doors so now we're making up the lower hole so this also goes for there's there's three versions of this you've got the 251 uh d then you've got the 251 stukas of us and then you've got the 2519, and Tamiya do all of those, and it's all the same basic lower hole model. Then the upper hole is slightly different, depending on, on which type. Uh, so here you can see the steering column is going on. It is workable, so it's articulated in, in um, two ways, so horizontally and vertically. And then you can turn the wheels. And it all just locks in. Once you glue this piece into where I've been pushing it there with my fingers, once that pointy pieces glued in and the rest will hold there so we're on to the wheels same old thing so we um, clip off the worst of it and then start sanding them around flush we've got the sprockets there as well you can see they're simple straightforward things uh, the wheels are um, quite a good design made to be left workable a lot of Tamiya stuff's meant to be workable in the sort of 90s all the wheels move and that so this is no exception so you've got that plastic insert inside which is left movable um, you've also got this insert that's going in which isn't a perfect fit but it's okay and that's obviously making up some of the side wall of the tire so if you're really concerned you could go ahead and fill that but as i say you know if you're approaching this model like i am you're not going to be worrying about that sort of thing if you are go for the afe club thing uh, one now with all that said i've added some tracks to this and i've only added tracks to this because these tracks were five pounds and i wanted to try them because that seems an astonishingly low amount and when the kit was 17 pounds you know we're not spending a lot of money and we're having a good time these tracks are well they were produced by a japanese company and i don't think they ever actually got to market and then hobby boss bought up the molds so hobby boss are producing these you get a whole load of sprues with the same thing. Um, you've all got, they've all got a sprue gate here, which I'm trying to cut out, and a little bit of flash. And you've got to cut it away, uh, you know, look away. It's, I'm cutting towards myself, but I'm not actually slicing. What I'm doing here is pushing the blade, like, onto the surface. So it's very controlled. It may look like I'm just hoping for the best that it don't go into my thumb, but I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't controlled. So once you've cleared it and you've got your actual peg that you, you're left with, you've then got a seam line going up and around the rubber block, uh, which is easily sorted out just by uh, swiping with a sanding stick. Once you've got it clear, the other part is actually pretty good, uh, the main track. And um, this rubber pad joins the two tracks together and then there are, you, you can articulate them, they, they move. However, you'll see later that we are actually going to have to glue these up at, at some point. So the detail on these is far superior to what you get in the kit, far superior to a lot of the um, 
rubber band tracks that you get on the 251s. The, the AFE Club ones come with rubber band tracks and they have the um, holes drilled out on the side, as you can see there. You can see the blue coming through those holes. But um, they don't... It, it's getting that rubber pad. It's really prominent and it stands out. And it's quite a strange looking thing when it goes around the sprocket. So there you can see, this is what you do. That's them glued together. And, you know, just keep going. They weren't actually that bad. Uh, I did all of these in an evening, watching the TV. It can't have been more than two hours. A lot of the time I was paused, you know, looking at the TV. So, although it looks like I'm about to do them on the bench, I'm, you know, I, <laughs> I can't do that. So you see, a run together, this is what you get. Nice articulation, it's good. You can, you know, conform it to any shape. Now, the downside of these is you literally get, like, three spares, maybe four. Some were broken, so you really got to be careful. Uh, and this is how they go on. One more link and it's too loose. So this is what you've got to put them on. They go on very tight. Then, at the end, this is in next week's video, we actually just glue them on and you get a lovely sag. It's perfect. Because you can glue the links together, they, they, they start to solidify in the shape that you conform them to. It works really well. Uh, so they're a great thing. Um, and the kit tracks are awful. And it's the one thing that really shows this kit up um, more than any of the other bits. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of errors. There's a lot of simplifications. But these tracks, as you can see, hopefully here, the tracks you get in the kit is what I've got here in the right. And... You know, they're really quite poor in comparison. There's no definition. The rubber block is not pronounced like it should be. Uh, so it's a really nice little upgrade to go for. If you're going to try one of these Tamiya kits, maybe try these tracks. It's a good way to start on um, inter individual link tracks. And you may notice we're starting to drip feed a few things in now as we're going forward. So we're starting to use some individual link tracks, starting to look at metal barrels, starting to look at camouflage which is the main reason for this model this is the first time we're actually going to do camouflage and it's going to be freehand camouflage with tamiya acrylics and i did have some issues so uh, that'll all be covered in next week's video um but i'll show you how to get through it there's a number of tricks you can get around um and also the first time is an interior so we obviously have to build this model somewhat like an aircraft uh we've got to think about the internals, what we're going to do with them, how we're going to put them together, what we're going to leave off, what we can get to, what we can't get to, and therefore we have to paint in sub-assemblies. So this does happen, this is the best way to approach an interior kit, is just treat it like you think you're doing a cockpit in an aircraft, and when that's done, that's a model in itself, you bring it in and around the uh, rest of the model, and then you build the rest of it up, so you build the airframe, put the wings on, etc. So uh, as part of the interior, we've got the upper hole and I'm also putting any of the bits on the lower hole that need to be done because as soon as we've painted the interior, we're going to join the upper part of the hole to the lower part of the hole. So there's some bits that need to be there for that. And as we're rattling on, we're getting the um, gun breech on because uh, the gun is an important piece of this. Uh, you always get a little bit of something in... Um, these versions so for this one you obviously get a gun you get the gun breech and you get a figure painting the side painting the winter camouflage on if you go for the straight 251 half track i believe you get a driver figure although there wasn't one in this and you get um a half a set of the uh, panzer grenadiers i think they call them jumping over the side so it makes a nice little action scene and then in the stukazu fuss you get rockets in crates all down the side of the hole and um, you also get uh, figures lifting them up. Quite well-defined muscles, if I remember rightly. It's an older figure set that's just been combined. That's generally what they do. So straightforward stuff here again. We're just um, a little bit off camera. I'm trying to work on this. Uh, we're getting the vision blocks in. So we've got the front and the rear to this. Um, if you're thinking 1997, this is this is pretty good for the time. I I don't know why I've got that. I, I, I think it's just 1990s, but I'm saying 1997. I seem to have that lodged in my memory for some reason. Um, it's pretty good. I think it's pretty good. If you'd have this kit then, if you think, you know, the FAMO came out in the 90s, 
They uh, 99, sorry. They're doing they were doing some good work for the 90s, Tamia. Um up there with the best. So uh Oh, Dragon also did some of these. However, they're very unobtainable in uh, the UK. So, um, AFE Club, I see them around. It's about £35. You don't get interlinking tracks. That's the only downside. You get these rubber band tracks, but they do their own set of interlinking tracks. You can buy the Hobby Boss ones, but they don't go around the sprocket so well. These Hobby Boss ones, uh, tracks that we've done, are actually designed to go around the Tamiya sprocket. If you look at um, Scale Mates for the tracks, You'll see there's a review on um, Perth Military Modelling site, PMMS, fantastic site. Slowed up a little bit for some reason. It doesn't seem to be updating so much now, but all the stuff he's done is there. And you'll see there's all the different sprockets that he's tried it around. So just something to think on there. If you're going to try these tracks, they, they might not apply to every single 251 sprocket. That's one of the major things with interlinking tracks, making sure they can go around the sprocket on your kit. So we're finishing off the gun breach here. We've got the uh, basket for catching the empty shells going on with the frame of that joining up. All simple stuff. Ejector pin marks here and there, and I've just tried to get rid of them where I can. Uh, same old trick, I sand them down if they're raised, I fill them with super glue if they're sunk, and then sand back flush as well. So. Not too tricky. And as I've been saying all along, it's a fine level of detail. It's it's perfectly good enough. But you can go a lot further with this. And we may be trying. Um, I'm thinking about coming back to a half track later on and I'm thinking about picking up the AFE Club one, to be honest. Maybe just the straight D or SC even. Quite like the early ones, the Hannah Mag one. So, something to uh, look out for. So, we've got the uh, gun sight there and the wheel for um, elevation. So, presumably the elevation wheel. Now, we've got the gunner's seat going on, which sits out rather precariously, but it, it all works. It's all right. It gives a bit of um, character. When it's in the model, uh, when it all comes together, you do you, it. It does build up quite a nice bit of um, well character inside the interior. As you look in, there's a lot going on, and I actually really like this model. Um, I've got it in the display case, and I'm looking at it as I'm talking, and I'm really, um, really pleased with it. It was quite a lot of work. Uh, the and there was some issues with the painting, but I, we do busy up the interior in the next. Uh, Part. Once it's all painted and then we've painted the outside, we then come back to the interior, do the final weathering and add the stowage. So make it look lived in, some crew um, bits and bobs, water cans, that sort of thing, machine gun, uh, helmet, hats, all of that sort of thing. And that really does a lot to uh, bring the model alive, make it look like it's lived in. So we are now getting into it. So what I'm going to show you here is how we're thinking about the painting. So we're planning the painting. We've got the interior sides of the hole and the actual half track. We've got the interior of the floor. We've got the gun and any other bits separated to their um, sub-assemblies that we can deal with. So that means they're built up as much as we can, but also to be able to paint everything. So if we have to take bits off, like the steering wheel, the seats, the cushions, all that sort of thing, uh, then you leave that off. Now we've got the paint to think about. So we're really looking at Dunkel Gelb, which is R-A-L something. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've forgotten it. Um, I haven't got that far with the R-O-L numbers. Um, but what we've got is is dark yellow. It's, it's Dunkel Gelb. So you've got two types from Tamiya. You've got XF60, which is their older one, a bit more richer yellow. And you've got the newer one, XF88. So we're going to go with XF88. However, both are fine. Just whatever you like. Then you've got the lacquer version. So you've got LP55. And again, as I say, we're trying to change things up all the way through this series. Now we're going to look at lacquer paints. Um although we're not going to spray them. So you can see the difference in the tone. There is a slight difference. 
although it's meant to be the same paint. Um, so that's something also to think about. Now the acrylic is not acrylic like Vallejo, like a water-based Citadel paint, but it is an acrylic paint, so it's not as smelly as the lacquer. So if you're limited on space, you're spraying out a window, you're doing it outside, or you know, you're just wearing a face mask, then you shouldn't be. You should be wearing, at least have a spray booth. You want to be spraying acrylic, but if you've got the spray mask, the spray booth, you've got a good drawer on it, you can start looking at some of these lacquer and um, products, which do help. So you've got cellulose thinners, I've just shown you there, rapid thinners and the Mr. Leveling thinners. Then you've got Tamiya's lacquer thinner. Now they're all the same thing. They're all a cellulose thinner that thins lacquer paint, but they have different properties. So the rapid thinner, which is the purple one, will uh, gas off quite quickly. So when you spray it, it, it will dry out relatively fast. You've got X20A in the middle there, which is the one for your acrylic as well, if you don't want to go down the lacquer route, and that's a kind of IPA based one. This is your rapid thinner. That's the one that vents off very quickly. The yellow one was Mr. Leveling Thinner, and that is just cellulose thinner with a retarder. So what that means is if you mix it with an acrylic, well, their acrylic version or a lacquer paint or whatever, um, what you'll find is it will dry out a little bit slower, but what it will help to do is give the paint more time to sink into recesses, sink around detail, and give you a very nice smooth finish. So if you find you get a lot of trouble, maybe you're spraying at a high pressure or something and you get a lot of trouble with uh, a grainy texture or the paint's not that smooth, try cutting your paint with the Mr. Leveling Thinner, which was the yellow one, and just see if it improves. And maybe add a little bit more thinner to your paint or lower the, uh, lower the air pressure. So what we're doing here is starting to paint in some of the details and I'm just using Citadel paints here, um, again, to be different. Uh, I've got the whole range there, well, most of the range, and just painting up some of the leather seats, I water it down in my wet palette, as we discussed last uh, in a previous video. And it's just pretty good for brush painting. It, it tends not to leave too many brush strokes. And we've painted up separately the cushions here, so they've been sprayed with just a dark brown leather colour. And now you can see the instrument panel. Now, this is not my best work by some level, uh, and it's reasonably poor, but for where it's going, you're actually going to get it blanked out like that anyway, as my fingers are showing. But if you were doing one of the other half tracks, you would see this from the back door. Um, and there's other ways to go around this. If you don't feel like brush painting it, you can actually get hold of some dry transfers. So these are the Archer Fine dry transfers left over from uh, when I built the FAMO. And as you can see, very, very good detail there. You can rub these on or treat them like a water slide decal. So you can you get a piece of water slide transfer paper, as it's called, and you rub this decal with a cocktail stick onto the transfer paper and then it acts as a decal and you rub it, you then run it into the recessed uh, area where you want to show off. We've also got placards as well. So these, where you go with them on a flat surface, we're not gonna get into dry transfers, but if you had a flat surface, you basically lay that dry transfer on and you rub it with a cocktail stick and it doesn't have any carrier fill and then it adheres to the surface, but that's in a perfect world, it does have its own problems, and I believe they've even got rid of them now, so it's a bit of an old school thing. So that was everything painted up, and now we're into the weathering. So simple stuff, a little bit of a pin wash around anything like this, uh, where there's some um, details that we need to get around, but for the vast majority of the internal surfaces, you will see what we do is just put a very uh, thin mix of oil over the flat surfaces and then we wick it away with more thinners and then using a blending brush we just blend it all in and we're really just giving it a filter make it look lived in give it a bit of subtle streaking and um, it gives a nice effect so I'll leave you with that now and we'll come back towards the end
So now that's all blended in, uh, we're just now looking at the interior, looking to see how everything is. We really want to make sure we've got enough sort of patina going on in there and um, it's starting to look the part, which it is. We've glued in most of the uh, bits that are going in now, so the seat cushions. We're going to leave the gun separate, uh, if we can. I think it's a bit of a wiggle to get it in. I think it's not terribly easy to leave it off when we've um, actually glued the top on. But it gives an okay effect, as you can see. It looks lived in. It looks like things have been going on in there. It doesn't look very clean. And then that gives us a base to come back to towards the end of the build, uh, which will be in next uh, week's video. And we'll just go back in there with some streaking. So that's pretty good. Uh, now we need to start thinking about planning the rest of the build and how we're going to actually uh, glue the uh, top section on. Um, I was hoping to leave the gun out, but I think because of the peg, I decided at this point we've got to glue the gun in and then we just have to mask around that. Because what we're going to have to do now is mask the interior. We can do that relatively easy around those flat sides, but when we get to the gun, it adds a bit of a problem. Obviously, if the gun would just slide out, it wouldn't be an issue. But as it doesn't, we just need to plan that. And that's what you need to think of. This is like an aircraft modelling aspect. You need to plan the build. If you're going to do a cockpit and you've got a bomb bay, for instance, you need to think about how you're going to go about that. And this is a similar thing when it comes to interiors. Uh, so we're pretty much committed now to glue the uh, upper hole down. And I really just clamped it in the areas I wanted, ran the glue around it, and it was fine. So now we've got these stowage boxes going along the side, which is one of the iconic features of the D variant. And to get those on, we've just got to push them in and that sort of hold them there. As you can see, they spring out from one side and you want to just get the glue in there and hold it up. Now I used a bit of super glue as a holding technique so I didn't have to stand there with my fingers. And the super glue does what your fingers are doing and then you glue it in with the extra fin. So I'm just checking why it was springing out. I couldn't really tell, to be honest. Um, it looks like something funny's going on there somewhere. I'm not sure what, but ultimately, as long as you pushed it up to where it needed to be, you could get it in. What you can also see there by my um, the greasy marks from my fingers, not because I had greasy fingers, but on a matte surface, you just you being you <laughs> leaves a mark. Uh, I um, I also sprayed up the lower hole at this point uh, when I was doing the interior, so the whole of the lower hole has been sprayed up through. So now we're putting on the fenders, and again, everything does fit, but you've got to you've got to just push it in and hold it. And if you just rely on uh, plastic glues, you'll find that you'll get a lot of um, glue splodging out the side. So I th I thoroughly recommend a very very fine touch of super glue here and there just to hold it, and then use your extra fin. I've changed up the uh, oh what would they be called? The um, they're from checking the size size indicators width indicators that, i think that's what they're called of course it's been a long time all i did is um got rid of the plastic part in the middle i think one snapped so i thought right if we're going to do this we're we'll get rid of them both and then just bent the wire up and replaced it and now we're putting in the small details like the lights and, and that this and that i do add a bit of wiring um i don't show me actually putting the wiring on i just followed the box up uh, for a little bit of fun and you can do the same. It's so simple wiring, and we'll have a look at the end of the different wires that I got. I've got a little bit just at the end of this video, just showing you the different wires. And that's another way to improve these sort of models by adding just a little bit of wiring here and there where you just line things up. So, where we've got this aerial mount here, it's not connected to the radio, so we're going to connect it to the radio, and then it just it just makes the eye tell the story and you don't think right what's that aerial antenna doing there is it wi-fi bluetooth 1943 bluetooth uh and there we go we're looking around the model we're pretty much there we're pretty much ready to start thinking about finishing off the build so now into a few final little touches i wanted to add we um get some headphones Oh, sorry. No, these are from a different build. These are from a different build. So keep, always keep your spares. This is from a build that we've already done. I think it may have even been from the 38T that I did. And I thought, well, let's wire these up, stick them into the radio, 
and have them sat on the seat. I thought it's part of that adding a little bit of interest to the crew quarters. So with a dab of glue, I've joined those two wires up. Uh, it's very thin copper wire and I've just twisted it as it goes down. And then we're gonna plug this into uh, one of the mounts in the radio. Now, if I'd thought about this at the start, I would have drilled out the holes in the radio because that makes life 20 times easier when you wanna glue these bits on. Whereas I'm just gluing a tiny bit of wire to a tiny bit of plastic. If it went in a hole, it would be good. So we've got some lead wire coming down from the aerial mount to the back of the radio. And then we've got the headphones mounted into the radio. Uh, and I think that's pretty good. That's the first little touch of making it look lived in. Just gives it a, just gives it something. And there's the wire from the headlight going down underneath the front section. And that's just on the box art, so that's all I'm copying. Um, not going wild, not adding tons of detail. All of the tool clamps and stuff, I don't, don't add to the tool clamps. They're just what comes in the kit. Um, I'm just doing a little bit of details here and there just to try and tell the story and and sell the idea of what's going on. So as I said, I was gonna show you about this wire. So what I've got here, this is an old roll from fly tying that I used to do as a youngster. My dad did, and I used to go with him more, more appropriately. And this is what we used to wrap around the flies to give a bit of weight. So it's a very thin copper wire. I'm sure you'll be able to find this. I mean, this is a lifetime roll. So yes, this roll will last a lifetime and uh, very good for the very fine wire. So that's quite good. That's one option. Then we've got lead wires. Now these are also used for fly tying, but they're a bit thicker. So you've got this one that's very heavy duty, and these are for making the flies sink in the water when you're fly fishing, if you, if you want to know. And uh, so they're very cheap. Uh, so lead wire is good because it's extremely malleable and it just stays where it is. So not only is it easy to bend, it's stiff at the same time. So I don't know if that makes sense. That's not the right property, but you know what I mean. It will hold its shape. Then you've got finer wire, but as it starts to get smaller, it's, you know, you could just pull it apart as I'm doing here. It's strange stuff, really. Um, and then you've got copper wire, which is pretty good. So a mixture of all of those, they're all relatively cheap. You can get this copper wire from other places. I've just bought this from Hysterex as I was putting an order in. Um, it's all relatively cheap and pretty good. So there we go, that does bring this video to an end. This is part one. I'll leave you with a sneak peek now, just one of the pictures from uh, next week's video. So we will get to this point in next week's video. As you can see, I'm really happy with this model. Um, one of the width indicators is broken off, which I didn't notice until afterwards, but nevertheless. Uh, so if you want to see how that's done, stay tuned. We'll go through the weathering. We're going to get a bit more advanced on the weathering now and try and step things up a little bit. Do some scratches, some sort of chipping here and there, uh, mud techniques, and fade that camouflage. So I'll show you how to do all of that in next week's video. So as always, thanks for uh, watching. Thanks for continuing to uh, stay tuned to these videos that I'm putting up. This is obviously an ongoing series, so if you want to stay tuned, um, follow the playlist down below. If you want to help out the channel, there's a couple links you can do that below. And as always, thanks for watching, stay tuned, and I'll see you in the next video.